Okay, can somebody confirm you can hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry for being late, I had trouble logging in. Uh, some people are using the chat, I'm gonna warn you, I do not see the chat notification when I share my screen, so I do not use chat. All right, I'm sharing my screen now. As I mentioned, uh, you need two instructors to teach the class if you use all of the features of Zoom, including the chat. And you've only got one instructor if you don't know. Uh, let's go to the lessons. Spring 2003. I already know what we're going to cover. We're covering chapter one and chapter 10. Oops, that's not the right spot. Maybe I'm too big. Remember, you don't have to read all of chapter 10, just uh, textbook pages 264 to 272. And that's the section on the classification of microorganisms. We will be meeting today to cover lab one in the lab. So when this class ends, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes before the lab. Any questions about what we're doing? Please recall that you do need to finish the online plagiarism quiz by this Saturday, 11.59 p.m. <clears throat> you also have uh, the chapter one lecture worksheet, which you only have to answer on the lecture worksheets, one or two questions. It tells you what it is for each uh, lecture worksheet. De it depends on the chapter. I think for chapter one, you only need to answer one question, but read it because I don't remember the specifics. Um, and recall that you have to have lab 00 turned in by 8 a.m. Friday, uh, April 7th, or you will be dropped from the class. The due date for lab one is the normal time, 11.59 p.m. Uh, Saturday, and that will be April 8th. Any questions about any of that? Um, I have a quick question regarding... Um the extra credit schedule. Um, so it has the three tabs. Do we fill out all three tabs? Uh, it depends. The first tab you have to fill out, that's your daily schedule. The second will be uh, your study schedule for microbiology. And if you use the same study schedule or you're planning to use the same study schedule for weeks one to the end of the term, you only need to fill out one tab. However, if you're planning like, uh, is it this week is Easter, so this would be the unusual week, probably. If you're planning to have a different schedule for this week than week two, then fill out a tab for week two. And if there's a, a different schedule to be doing for week three, just uh, make another tab and put it in uh, the third tab. Any questions about that? All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm assuming that, that, that everything is good. Why am I, oh, I see. There it is there. Let me look and see if anything else is due. I think the extra credit study schedule, meaning the worksheet, is due, yes, yeah, Saturday, 11.59 p.m. The picture, though, is due uh, not this coming Saturday, but a week from this Saturday. All right, any question about anything? If not, let's go ahead and go to the lesson. So we were talking about microorganisms and what they were. Uh, I did discuss a cell. Let's define what a cell is. A cell is the basic structural 
and functional unit of all organisms. It's a highly organized compartment bounded by a thin, flexible structure that we call the plasma membrane. So all living things are made of cell, or at least all living organisms. And we're not going to talk about whether viruses are alive or not. And that's actually a, an argument which we're not going to get into. Uh, but all cells contain three components. They, of course, contain a cell membrane. They also contain cytoplasm. And all cells contain DNA as their genome. Any question about any of that? Seeing some bacterial cells there. When we're talking about microbes, where in these pictures would you find microbes? Or where would you not find microbes? Anyone have a guess? Like on this picture here, let me blow that up. Do you find microbes on the rocks, in the water? Anyone have a guess? Nobody has a guess? Don't be shy. Uh, there are microbes in the water. There's microbes on the plants. There are microbes on the rocks. How about in this one? Do we find microbes in the ocean? Or how about in the air? Yes. Yes, we I do. I feel like that would be in everything yeah. except for the lava. Yeah, microbes would be everywhere except for the lava here. We find microbes in the air. You can find microbes up about a mile into the air. And in the soil, you can find microbes down about a mile into the soil. Obviously, that uh, requires soil. If you have, what is that, rock, uh, the microbes may not be there. And you find uh, microbes under the ocean floor down about a mile as well, in, under the ocean floor. Microbes on the person and the cat, the door. Microbes in the desert, including in the desert air. So microbes are here along this volcanic vent. And they're everywhere, even around the edge of the volcanic vent. But they would not be where the lava is. That would be too hot for microbes to live. And so any fell that, that fall in there would die. And then that's telling you where we find microbes. So we say microbes are essentially everywhere on the planet Earth. And we say that they are ubiquitous, and we can find them everywhere. Where is everywhere? Environments where on land and in the water, in the atmosphere, as I stated, up to about a, a mile in the air, you can find uh, mostly spores, but other microbes are carried by the air vents, uh, air, air wind, whatever. Uh, subsurface under the land and under the ocean on plants and animals, essentially everywhere where liquid water is present. And we can find microbes alive and being metabolically active between the temperatures of a minus 20 degrees Celsius. Remember, zero degrees Celsius is when water freezes, up to about 120 degrees Celsius. Remember that boiling water occurs at 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, what we do is we have microbes that have antifreeze in them, and they can be metabolically active down to uh, 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, below that temperature, they, you might have live microbes, but they will be frozen, and they will not be metabolically active. And uh, why we have microbes at 120 degrees Celsius is under the deepest part of the ocean, the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean, you have so much water on top of the water in the trench that in the volcanic vents, microbes can live and exist at 120 degrees Celsius. Above that temperature, the water will begin to boil. So it's not boiling at 100 degrees because there's so much water on top of it that the water has to go to 120 degrees Celsius from mostly the water pressure 
but also the, there's some salt in there and that elevates the temperature that water boils at. And there's the spread um, in Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit, minus four degrees to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. How many microorganisms are there? Well, microbes are the most numerically abundant life form on the planet. In one gram of soil, there are about 10 to the eighth cells per gram. We're talking about microorganisms. Now, obviously this depends on the soil. The wetter the soil, the more organic matter in the soil you will have more microbes in it. The drier the soil, the less organic matter you have in it, the less microbes you'd have in the soil. So obviously the desert would have less microbes than, I don't know, um, the Pacific Northwest, Western Oregon or Western uh, Washington, especially in the uh, forest floor where there would be lots of organic matter. And then there's lots of moisture too, okay? But this is something like the average gram of soil. So average humidity, uh, like your garden soil in the, I don't know, late spring or early summer, something like that. In a milliliter of ocean water, which is about one gram of ocean water, would you have more or less microbes? You have a 50-50 shot here, people. More. Uh, anyone have another guess? Meaning- Less. Hey, that's, that's incorrect, <laughs> yeah, it, it's less. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. In a gram of human feces, especially if it's fresh, a fresh feces, straight out of the individual, you'd have more, okay? On one human being, you'd have much more. On the entire earth, you'd have much more. And here are the numbers here. We only have about one times 10 to the six microbes in a milliliter of ocean water. That's very close to a gram of ocean water. And in the soil, we said you had about one times 10 to the eighth. In a gram of human feces, if it's a fresh feces, you have one times 10 to the 11th microorganisms per gram of human feces. That's actually 55% of the wet weight of the feces. So over half. If you had a dry human feces, and that would be like somebody going to the bathroom in the desert, and then you come by a day or two later and the feces have dried, you'd have around one times 10 to the six. So once again, it depends how fresh the feces are. And one human, you have 3.8 times 10 to the 13th microbes. And I'm talking about bacteria and yeast and other cellular microbes. On the entire human, I mean, excuse me, on the entire planet Earth, we have one nonillion. You probably never even heard of that number. That is one followed by uh, 30 zeros or one times uh, 10 to the power of 30. For uh, comparison, the human population on the planet Earth is between 7 billion and 8 billion. I think it's getting very close to 8 billion now. Any question about any of that? All right. When we're talking about microorganisms, you should realize that some microorganisms do cause disease. If a microorganism does cause human disease, we call it a human pathogen or a pathogenic microbe. When we're talking about pathogens, you should understand that most microorganisms do not cause disease. Only a small percentage of microbes are pathogenic. 
only a small percentage of all microbes cause disease. When we're talking about disease, it is also important to distinguish between an infectious disease and an inherited disease. An infectious disease is one that is caused by a microorganism. And that's why it's infectious, because it can spread from one host to another. And that's because the microbe can spread from one host to another. Inherited diseases are diseases caused by the person's genetics. Most inherited diseases are diseases that the person will be born with. What's an example of an infectious disease? Come on, don't be shy. COVID. COVID-19, yes. Another? The flu. Yes. Both of these are viral diseases. Can anyone mention a bacterial disease? Or we could say a yeast disease. Anthrax. Anthrax, yes. Okay, and give me an example of an inherited disease. Anyone? Uh, how about sickle cell anemia? The child will be born with sickle cell anemia, and it's because the child has two genes for sickle cell anemia. I mean, this is a recessive trait, well, mostly recessive trait. And uh, to become a sickle cell anemia patient, you have to have two alleles for it because otherwise the normal allele would offer at least some protection. Actually, it offers quite a lot of protection, meaning uh, especially in the Pacific Northwest, the, <laughs> the child born as a carrier of sickle cell anemia would not normally be under stress and so would not have uh, any detrimental traits. And it's only when the child would come under environmental stress that some of the sickle cell trait would come out. And there actually was a case of it in Florida, which uh, the, the child was um, older, I think it was a teenager, and uh, was misbehaving. So he was sent to a like a reform school, and it was like a military boarding school. And they made the child uh, run uh, all the children in the camp or facility ran each morning before breakfast and in Florida in the summertime even at that time it was quite warm the child hadn't had any water all night long hadn't had anything to eat either and then was forced to do the running and uh, in the extreme heat and the dehydration the child went into um I'm not sure what the term would be, but uh, sickle cell shock, something like that. And then the uh, child fainted and the people thought that the child was faking it to get out of running. And uh, they took him to the nurse and the nurse gave him smelling salt. And the smelling salt was uh, something like ammonia, which normally in a healthy individual, they can handle that. But this child was under uh, sickle cell shock. And it immediately, the uh, smelling salts or smelling whatever uh, made the child's cells, which normally were uh, in a carrier state, they made them become sickle cell. And then the child uh, uh, had sickle cell disease and the blood clotted. And I think he had either a stroke or a heart attack and it killed the child. So normally under most cases in the Pacific Northwest, the child would not be under stress, but you could be under stress under extreme environmental conditions, as I stated. Anyways, the point is that was a genetic trait. It is not infectious, does not spread the disease. And uh, the cold and COVID-19 can spread. Anthrax can spread from one patient to another. Any questions about infectious or inherited diseases? 
Here we're looking at some microorganisms. Let me blow this slide up. Why am I not getting that? Oh, here we go. Uh, bacteria. These are uh, mold. Uh, what do you call that? Not spores, but hypha of mold. That looks like a white blood cell to me, but it could be an uh, amoeba. Uh, this is Volvox, and actually each cell is one of these dots. And this is the parent colony. And these little green circles are baby colonies, which will come out. The, the, the parent will open up and that will release the baby colonies and then they'll go out and uh, uh, move elsewhere and grow elsewhere. And this, I believe, is the HIV virus right there, probably infecting a uh, T4 cell, a T cell. Uh, how small are uh, microorganisms? Well, this is showing you, although boy, I'm not able to see it. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm not sure why I'm not able to read that. Scanning electron microscopic image. This is one micrometer, and that's close to one micrometer, just a little bit longer, and it's actually skinnier than one micrometer. And generally, most microorganisms that are bacteria are in the neighborhood of around one micrometer. Even the bigger ones are not bigger than two micrometers. Uh, this uh, is fungi mold, and it's a little larger. That's 50 micrometers. This also is 50 micrometers. This is 10 micrometers, and there are about 10 of those there. So this is close to 100 micrometers long, certainly over 50 micrometers long. And then this is, I'm not sure why this one is uh, so large, probably because they're measuring the white blood cell, 50 uh, micrometers long there. Uh, obviously, microorganisms showing you come in different shapes, sizes, and arrangements. Microorganisms play beneficial roles on the planet and for people. Microorganisms decompose organic waste. They are producers in the ecosystem. Uh, if you don't know what producers are, for most of us, those are photosynthetic organisms like green plants and green photosynthetic bacteria, but the producers are also the chemosynthetic bacteria, and they can make sugar, not from light in photosynthesis, but from chemical, and we call those uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. Microorganisms play a big role in the nitrogen cycle, and that benefits the planet. We can use microorganisms to make industrial chemicals, such as ethanol that you probably are putting in your car right now when you fill up your tank. Uh, we can use them to make acetone and many other industrial chemicals as well. We can use microorganisms to make insecticides. And this is actually an important uh, case of insecticide because if the microorganism makes the insecticide, they're less toxic to humans than a man-made insecticide. We use microorganisms to ferment food, such as vinegar, cheeses, most bread, any leavened bread, and beer. We use microorganisms to make products used in manufacturing, like cellulase. We use microorganisms to make antibiotics. If you don't know, penicillin G, is made by a microorganism, a fungi, and you just grow it up and then you isolate the penicillin G. We do use microorganisms to make other products, such as products used in medicine. All human insulin sold today, at least in the United States, is uh, uh, made in a microorganism. What they did was they took the human insulin gene out of a person and put it into a bacteria and then grew the insulin in the bacteria and then isolate the insulin, purify it, and then send it to the diabetic patients. 
Any question about any of that? Let's talk a little bit about modern biotechnology and genetic engineering. Biotechnology is the use of microbes and organisms to produce foods and products for human use. Most people think it is new, but it is not. Biotechnology is actually centuries old. Like humans have been cloning corn for centuries. And we've been fermenting food like uh, sauerkraut for centuries. And wine, for example, the making of wine, that dates back to ancient Egypt. So that's something like, I don't remember if it's 6,000 or 8,000 years, but something like that. Okay, that is the use of biotechnology. Genetic engineering is a new technique of biotechnology, where we take genes of interest and then put them into an organism of interest, such as the case where we took the human insulin gene out of a person and then put it into bacteria so that we could grow up the bacteria and grow or make the insulin and then purify the insulin for human use. Some applications of genetic engineering, including producing a variety of proteins from bacteria and fungi, such as various vaccines and enzymes. Uh, gene therapy, where a child is born with defective genes, and then you insert the correct gene into the child using gene therapy. Uh, usually this is a child born with a defective immune system and the child has a mutant gene that does not make a certain component of the immune system. And then you take out the child's immune cells, grow them in vitro, put in the correct gene, which complements the patient. So now their immune system is functioning and then put the cells back into the child. Any question about that? And then genetically modified bacteria is another example of genetic engineering. Uh, I don't know if any of you, well, obviously the, the uh, bacteria that make insulin would be an example of a genetically modified bacteria. Some of you may have heard of the flavor saver tomato when it was first introduced. It was the big thing and all supermarkets had it. it the, the idea was this tomato would sit on the shelf of the store and it would not rot as easily as a regular tomato. And so the stores loved it because the tomato would stick around longer to be sold. Uh, people didn't tend to buy it. And over time, I noticed the flavor saver tomato became more rare and rare. And now I'm not sure if I've ever found a store that even sells it. So if you know a store that sells it, you might tell me. But uh, lately, I don't know of any stores that sell the flavor saver tomato. And what they did was they found a gene that allowed the tomato to ripen and then stay ripe for a long period of time. I'm not sure how long, but longer than a normal tomato. Any question about any of this? All right. So let's talk a little bit about microbes and human welfare. We're gonna talk about microbial ecology. Uh, all things have an ecology, including microbes. Uh, bacteria are report important on the planet for recycling nitrogen. We've already mentioned that, but they also help recycle carbon. They do recycle nutrients. When something dies, the nutrients in that organism are recycled by either microbes or by a fungi like a mushroom. So the nutrients are recycled on the planet uh, by either microbes or fungi. Uh, they help recycle sulfur and phosphorus. Now it is true that 
microbes are involved in the recycling of car carbon, sulfur, and phosphorus, but understand that the steps in these cycles involving microbes are less than the steps in the nitrogen cycle. In the nitrogen cycle, most of the steps in the nitrogen cycle are happening because of a microbe. In the carbon cycle and the sulfur cycle and the phosphorus cycle, it's only some of the steps are happening because of a microbe. Uh, these examples of microbial mediated biochemical cycles that help support life on Earth. Uh, why it helps support life on Earth is, is that if the nutrients were to be in something that died and a microbe or a fungi were not to recycle it, the carbon, the nitrogen, the nutrients, and the sulfur and the phosphorus would just stay there and would accumulate. And so we do need the microbial mediated biogeochemical cycles to help support life on Earth to continuously recycle these elements and nutrients on the planet. The first people to show the microbial ecology in the microbial mediated biochemical cycles were Winogransky and Bajorink in the 1880s and 1892. And uh, they were able to do this because unlike most microbiologists, they did not study a peer species. They, Winogransky and Bajorink, studied microbes in communities, vast communities working together. And you need a community to recycle carbon, nitrogen, nutrients, sulfur, and phosphorus. And the reason why this is such a spread, that's 12 years, although they don't say it started in 1880, started sometime in 1880, the 80s, doesn't say the exact year, is because it depends on which cycle you're talking about that Winogratsky and Bajorink studied. If I knew, could remember, I think the sulfur was the first one they discovered. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the term and what they did, which they just used a column of mud and uh, noticed that microbes were growing in different places in the column of mud. And... Uh, found that they were recycling sulfur and the other nutrients in the column of mud. Uh, any question about any of that? Microbes are also important in human welfare in the sense that microbes can engage in bioremediation. Bioremediation literally means we use life to remedy or to remedy with life. You use living organisms to deal with an environmental problem. Like this is a oil spill and these individuals are spraying microbes on it so that the microbes can digest the oil, breaking the oil down into carbon dioxide and water. And that would recycle the, well, the carbon and the, nutrients in the oil, okay? We use bioremediation to recycle sewage, meaning break down sewage and recycle it, once again, mainly to carbon dioxide and water. But we can use bacteria on pollutants other than oil, which I've got shown here and already discussed. We can use bacteria on the pollutant mercury. Now, bacteria do not degrade mercury. It is an element itself, so you can't degrade it further. But the bacteria can convert mercury from one form to another. And the bacteria generally make it from an elemental form where the mercury is just pure mercury and then make it an organic form of mercury, which is much less toxic to humans than pure mercury. 
meaning elemental mercury. Any question about any of that? We can use microbes as a biological insecticide. And these are alternative to chemical pesticides, which are generally man-made. These biological insecticides can help prevent insect damage and then the disease transmission among plants, not usually among people, but among plants. And so they're an important source of uh, insecticides. And like I stated, they're much less toxic, the biological insecticides, than a man-made pesticide. The biological insecticides are usually considered organic. And some of you, if you've ever used an organic insecticide, know that those are safe to spray on crops, at least generally. And then you can go and eat the crops because it has a biological insecticide. Can anyone name a biological insecticide? I used to use one, but I don't remember the name. That's why I was asking. It's a, usually a complex name. Uh, let's talk about one biological insecticide. It's Bacillus thuringiensis, which is actually a bacteria. Oops, went too far. Go back. I'm trying to blow this up. There we go. So there's the bacteria, and this bacteria does form endospores. That's where you're seeing. I keep hitting that accidentally. Come on. That's what you're seeing there, but there's the um, bacillus. That's actually two bacilli, and there's an endospore there. Uh, bacillus thuringiensis, uh, the bacteria are fatal to many insects. So you can use this as an insecticide. And then Bacillus thuringiensis is harmless to humans and other animals, as well as it's harmless to plants. And my father in the 1960s actually bought some Bacillus thuringiensis and put it on his apple trees, put it on the apples to use as a biological insecticide. And the apples did have less worms than they would have had if he had never used Bacillus thuringiensis. He was disappointed because he was hoping it would make the apples wormless, but he never read the directions. It says on the directions you have to apply the Bacillus thuringiensis every two weeks, which is what you have to do with the man-made insecticides. You have to spray the apples every two weeks or else the fly can lay its egg on the apple and then you'll get worms on the apple. You need to apply the Bacillus thuringiensis every two weeks. And it did state on the directions, you have to apply the Bacillus thuringiensis after every time it rains. And my father was living in Western Oregon, which is very similar to Western Washington. And so you can imagine in the spring, it was raining a fair amount of the time. The rain will wash the Bacillus thuringiensis off the apple, which is why you have to reapply it after it rains. So it would have worked if my father had followed directions, but he was too lazy and he only applied it one time. So it didn't work well, but it did produce less worms than it would have been if he didn't do anything. Any questions about any of that? Uh, would diatomaceous earth be considered a biological insecticide? It is for some insects. I can't tell you off my top of my head what diatomaceous earth is toxic to, but I believe it is toxic to some insects. And I think it's because what is in it is uh, toxic to the insect. Okay. Have you used diatomaceous earth as a insecticide? Um, I've heard that it works for uh, cockroaches and some other uh, 
uh, pests like that. Okay, I haven't heard that. I'd be surprised it works on cockroaches because those things are resistant almost to everything. But I don't know. I've never used diatomaceous earth on cockroaches. I did live in Houston, which was filled with cockroaches, and uh, they used man-made insecticides. And the insecticides generally did not kill all of the cockroaches, even though it was very toxic to most of them. So I'd be surprised if it worked on cockroaches, but I don't know, it might work on cockroaches. It's just, they are really resistant to a lot of things. All right, if there's no questions about anything we've discussed, we're gonna change gears here a little bit. Any further questions? If not, let's get into the naming and classifying of microorganisms. This individual actually began both the naming of organisms and the classifying of all organisms. Does anyone know who this is? Who began the scientific names and who began the classification of living things in biology? Nobody knows? You should know that from your Biology 160 class. Uh, he has a couple of names because he's Swedish, and I think it was Carl Lay or Carly, something like that, Lene, but he didn't like his Swedish name, so he Latinized it, and is most often named as Carlus Linnaeus. However, our textbook calls him Carl Linnaeus, which is kind of odd because he's, they're keeping the Swedish first name, and then they're Latinizing his last name, but it doesn't matter. You're getting the point. Carlos Linnaeus or Carl Linne is the person who began the naming of organisms, including microbes, and began the classification of all living things, including microbes. He did that in 1735. This began the scientific nomenclature where all organisms have two names. They have their genus name, like Homo for the genus of man, and then a specific epithet name, which would be sapiens. Uh, this is saying species, but that's not quite correct because the species name is both the genus and the specific epithet. Everyone get that? So to name a species, you have to have two names, the genus name and the specific epithet name. You cannot, when you're naming a human, you can't call them homo because uh, previously there were other species in the genus homo, like uh, homo neanderthal, that was another genus. And I don't remember the name for the hobbit. It's something like Homo hobbitus, something like that. Okay. And you can't also name the species sapiens because there are other species that have a different genus name that uh, has the name sapiens. I don't know of any personally, but uh, I can tell you that uh, for E. coli, which is E stands for Escherichia coli, is the species name. But if you were just to say coli, it could be E. coli for Escherichia coli, or it could be Ballantidium coli or B. coli. Okay. So you can't name a species by one name, the specific epithet, and you can't name it by the genus name because most genuses have more than one species in it on the planet Earth currently alive. Uh, it is true, at least at the moment, Homo only has one. 
but in the past, there was one time when there were three living species in the genus Homo. It's just two of those species went extinct. Although you could argue they're not totally extinct because Homo uh, Neanderthal uh, does make up, I think it's about 2% of the genome of Europeans. And it also makes up something like 1% of the genome of Asians. I think the genome of, uh, of Blacks is very, very low. So Homo uh, Neanderthal did not interbreed much with the genome of Blacks. All right, the scientific nomenclature is also called the binomial nomenclature because it is both the scientific name and it is a name that has two names. Bi means two, so two, nomo means name. So two names, nomenclature. Any question about any of that? So when you're writing, or typing the scientific name, the name should be either italicized, or if you're writing it and you can't write in italics, you should underline it. And that means it is a scientific name. The genus name, the first name of the two name system should be capitalized. And I've got that there, homo is capitalized. And then the lower the, uh, Specific epithet name should be all lowercase, and sapiens is all lowercase. The names are Latinized, meaning they're based on Latin, and they're used worldwide. So wherever you are in the planet, you can use this name to indicate that species. So whatever language you're speaking, wherever you are in the world, you say homo sapien, and that means human. Is that clear? Use worldwide. The name may be descriptive or honor a scientist. Homo sapien is descriptive. Uh, let me see, uh, homo means a man that walks on two feet or something like that, man that walks on two feet. And then sapien means wise. So homo sapien literally means wise man. E. Escherichia coli is both descriptive and honoring a scientist. It's descriptive because it's called coli because you can find this in the intestines, meaning the colon, so coli. And then Escherichia is honoring a scientist. One of the early microbiologists was Aster, Aster, something like that, it's a German name. And that's why they named it Escherichia coli. Staphylococcus aureus is descriptive. Staphylo means cluster, looking like a cluster of grapes. Caucus means uh, uh, round ball shaped, and that would be the grape shape. And then aureus means golden. And Staphylococcus aureus are golden round cells that grow in a cluster, like a cluster of grapes. Any question about any of that? After the first use, scientific names may be abbreviated with the first letter, a period, meaning the first letter of the genius and a period, and the specific epithet. You do need to spell it out the first time though. So Staphylococcus aureus should be spelled out the first time. All other times in your entire paper, you can then abbreviate it S period aureus. 
Escherichia coli is the way it should be used the first time. And then all other times you can abbreviate it E. coli. However, E. coli is so widely known and so widely used that even among scientists, they will often use E. coli the first time. And nobody has any trouble understanding which species they mean. Okay, but that's the only one that's an exception. All other cases, you should spell it out the first time and then abbreviate. Any question about any of that? All right, that's enough for the naming and classifying of organisms. Excuse me, the naming of organisms. Now let's talk about the classifying of organisms. The classifying of microorganisms began with Carlos Linnaeus, who also began the classification system. However, we do not use his classification scheme anymore because he classified all living things into a plant or an animal. He included even microorganisms as either a plant or an animal. And we don't classify things that way anymore. So the classification system is not the same as the scientific nomenclature system. And that is we're still using Carlos Linnaeus scientific nomenclature. We're not using his classification system. But he did begin the classifying of microorganisms. And let's talk a little bit more about the classification of all living things on the planet Earth. So when you have all living things, we can break that down into three groups. And this is the three domain system, breaking all living organisms down into the bacteria. Let me blow this up. Into the bacteria into the domain archaea, or called the archaea bacteria, and into the domain eukarya, the eukaryotes. This domain system is defined. We define an organism based upon the sequence of its DNA. That means that all organisms which are bacteria, if we were to sequence their DNA, we'd find that all members of this domain are much closer in the sequence of their domain to all other organisms in this domain than to any organism outside the domain. Like E. coli has a sequence of DNA much closer to all of the other bacteria than to any archaea and to any eukarya. Any question about any of that? So the first classification system is defined, and there's only three of them, the domain, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And if ever we discover a new species, which they do from time to time, they see, simply sequence the DNA, and that will tell us which domain the organism belongs to. Any question about that? Now we can further divide the domains into a kingdom. The kingdoms have no definition. So people argue about what a kingdom is, what, which, which kingdom an organism belongs to, and about how many kingdoms there are. These are all arguments. We're going to use the six kingdom approach where the domain bacteria has one kingdom, which is also the bacteria. So the kingdom and the domain are the same for bacteria. The same with archaea. The domain is archaea and the kingdom is archaea. So the kingdom and the domain are the same. 
And then the domain Eukarya is broken into four different kingdoms. Kingdom Plantae, the plants. Kingdom Animalia, the animals. Kingdom Fungi, the fungus. And then Kingdom Protista, the protus. This will be the kingdom approach we use. Now you should understand that the kingdom Protista is not a monophyletic group. Kingdom plants, animals, and fungi are monophyletic. The kingdom Protista is a eukaryote, which is not a plant, not an animal, not a fungi. And so the kingdom Protista has different common ancestors. Any question about any of that? Hopefully you're not confused on this part. Uh, my point is, is that this is not one group. And with the different numbers of kingdom systems, like the nine kingdom approach and the 12 kingdom approach and the 15 kingdom approach, what they do is they divide the kingdom protista into more kingdoms. When you get up to the 20 kingdom approach, you then can start dividing. I think it's the plants are divided into two kingdoms. And you get higher kingdom approaches like 30 and 50 kingdom approach. You start dividing the bacteria and the archaea as well as all of these branches on the kingdom eukarya. Uh, my point here is, is that the number of kingdoms is actually in debate. It's been in debate for close to 20 years now, and they'll probably never resolve this debate until they came up with a definition for what the heck a kingdom is, okay? We will use the six kingdom approach just because it's easy, and it also, is the approach that the majority, well, I don't know if the majority, the plurality of biologists follow. There are different numbers of kingdoms. Some people use a three kingdom approach where each domain is one separate kingdom. And that means the kingdom and the domains are the same. There's the five kingdom approach, which I don't like because it joins bacteria and archaea into one kingdom. And they're in two different domains. So in my opinion, you shouldn't combine them. There's a six kingdom approach, which I've already talked about, uh, a nine kingdom approach, a 12 kingdom approach, a 15 kingdom approach, a 20 kingdom approach, and higher orders. Like I said, biologists have been arguing about how many kingdoms there are for about 20 years now. Might even be over 20 years, but about 20 years. And so we're not going to get into that argument. And, and uh, I, when I'm talking about kingdoms, I'm just going to use the six kingdom approach because it's easy. Any question about anything? Yeah, I have a question. Uh huh. So when you say six kingdom approach, are you saying bacteria, archaea, plant, animal, fungi, protista? Yeah, those are the six kingdoms. Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, you can classify uh, things underneath kingdom. We're not going to get into that. Let me see if I can remember this. King Peters. So phyla would be next, or subphyla would be under that. Uh, sub King Peters, son, king. So uh, class order, all of those things, okay? Uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh, when we talk about viruses, we'll talk about family. That is one of the classification systems. And then there's genus and then species. We're not going to get into that. So we'll only hold you to knowing the domains and the kingdom as a classification system. I'm probably not going to quiz you on how many kingdoms there are because like I stated, that's up for debate, who you're asking. Uh, but you should know that 
kingdom is not defined and a domain is defined. When we're talking about the three domain system, you should realize that your textbook says that the domains have different types of cell and they call this a cell type. Now, some people don't use the word cell type and they call this a super kingdom. Your textbook author does not use the word super kingdom. A super kingdom is something that has been around in biology even before the domain came about. So you can divide all living things into a super kingdom and then divide the super kingdom into domains. Okay. Uh, we won't get into that much because your textbook author doesn't talk about it that way, but realize that you can call it a cell type as your textbook author does, or many other authors call it a super kingdom. Any question about that? Okay, what are the cell types and what are the super kingdoms? Uh, bacteria have the cell type prokaryotic cells. Archaea also have the cell type or super kingdom prokaryotic cells. The eukarya have the cell type eukaryotic cells, or you could call that a super kingdom. Any question about that? So a super kingdom would be above a domain. So you have all living things, a super kingdom, a domain, and then underneath that you have a, a kingdom. It is important to know the cell type because prokaryotes are distinctly different cells than eukaryotes. I think you've been taught about prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes in a previous class, but we will touch on that topic later in the term. Let's talk about some of the characteristics of the domain bacteria. Their cell type is their prokaryotes. We can find peptidoglycan in all the bacteria that have a cell wall. Peptidoglycan is the main molecule in the cell wall. Bacteria generally divide by binary fission. That literally means the cell will split into two. For energy use, the domain bacteria can get their energy from all of the possible energy sources that life can use. Uh, they can get their energy need from an organic chemical such as glucose, and that should be familiar to you because we do the same. We get our energy needs from an organic chemical such as glucose. But some bacteria can get their energy needs from an inorganic chemical like hydrogen sulfide gas or iron or uh, nitrate. And these are the chemosynthetic bacteria getting their energy needs from an inorganic chemical. And then some of the bacteria can get their energy needs from photosynthesis, meaning that some bacteria are green or some other color, depending on their pigment, and uh, can engage in photosynthesis, making food from CO2 and water. Any question about any of that? Most of the domain bacteria are either free living decomposers or their primary producers. But some of the domain bacteria are par parasitic, meaning they live off another organism. 
and some of the domain bacteria are pathogenic, meaning they cause human disease. We're talking about human pathogens. Any questions about the domain bacteria? All right, let's move on to the domain archaea. They are prokaryotic cells. Does anyone know, do the archaea have peptidoglycan? It's either a yes or a no. All right, nobody wants to guess. You got a 50% chance here. Um, no. None, yes, you're correct. None of the archaea have peptidoglycan. This is a molecule found only in the cell wall of uh, the domain bacteria. Some of the domain archaea are found in extreme environments. And initially, that was where we found the archaea, meaning that was initially where we found the, the, the domain archaea. This includes methanogens, archaea that produce meth methane gas. Uh, they metabolize meth methane or a, a methanogen, meth methanogenic compound. Uh, some of the archaea are extreme halophiles. Those are organisms that live in high salt concentration. Uh, an example of that would be an archaea that grows in the Dead Sea. That would be the sea between Jordan and Palestine. Some of the archaea are extreme thermophiles, meaning they live in very hot environments. Now for the methanogens, actually for all of these, but especially the methanogens and the thermophiles, you can find some bacteria which are extreme methanogens or extreme thermophiles. When we look at all of the Earth's biomes, we can find archaea in all of the Earth's biomes. So the archaea or the archaea bacteria are found everywhere on the planet they are a significant portion of the organisms in the soil, and they're a significant portion of the organisms in the sea, ocean water, in plankton. So uh, the older textbooks will talk about the archaea living in extreme environments. That's not totally correct. We do find the archaea everywhere on the planet. And I think the newer versions of our textbook, including the, the third edition of the textbook made specifically for Clark College, does talk about that, that we do find archaea everywhere on the planet, that they're more than just found in extreme environments. Now, are any of the archaea pathogenic? Is there any member of archaea that cause human disease? Anyone know? I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to assume that nobody knows. There are no archaea that cause human disease. So none of the archaea are pathogenic, at least that we know of. For this reason and this reason alone, after this lesson, we're hardly going to talk about the archaea. And it's not because the archaea are not important. It's simply because the focus of this class is to talk about microbes that cause human disease and none of those microbes causing human disease are in the domain archaea. Any question about any of that? Um, since it says that some of them are found in extreme environments, are they the only ones that would be found in extreme environments? No, it says some are found in extreme environments. Oh, are you asking the question? Are there other organisms living in these extreme environments? 
Yeah, I was asking if that's the only domain that would uh, be able to thrive in extreme environments. Uh, that's a separate question. So let's talk about the first. In the Dead Sea water of uh, the Dead Sea, you can find archaea, and I think those are actually the major organisms living in the Dead Sea. However, you can find some halophiles of the domain bacteria also in the Dead Sea. It's just that the Dead Sea is extreme salt. I don't think we have any place where the salt water is higher than that. Um, like the Great Salt Lake isn't as quite as salty as the Dead Sea is, but uh, um, my point is in the extreme environments where we find halophiles, you can also find, uh, excuse me, halophiles, which are archaea, you can also find halophiles, which are in the domain bacteria. Generally, we do not find eukaryotes in these extreme environments. There may be some exceptions, but generally we don't. Now you asked another question and that was, no, you answered it. I was asking if um, they would be the only domain that can thrive in extreme environments, but you mentioned yeah. the, no. the other ones from bacteria. Yeah, they're, they're not the only domain. Uh, okay, thank you. Right. You had another question in there, and I, I don't remember what it was, so I'm not going to try to answer it anymore. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember, so. Oh, I think the question was, is this the only environment you would find that extreme halophile. It depends on the species. Some species of extreme halophiles are only found in extreme salt conditions, meaning where you have lots of salt around. But there are some species which are tolerant of less salt. So uh, I used to know this is the I think the highest salt you can get is 20%. Let me see if I got that on my slide here. I don't. I think it's 20%, but it might be 30%. You can't get higher than that because the salt precipitates out of the water. Um, so usually those species would only be found there. Maybe they could grow in another halophile environment, one that's... Uh, slightly less, but still has a lot of salt, but you cannot find them in an environment that would be low in salt, for example. Generally speaking, that would be the case, but there are some exceptions. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus is a halophile that can survive 20% salt concentration, which our skin can get up to 20% sodium chloride, and Staphylococcus aureus can thrive in that, but it can grow on a petri dish that has the sodium chloride around 0.9%. That would be normal isotonic salt conditions. I've never tried to grow on something less than 0.09%, uh, but it does grow on 0.09%, so it could probably grow a little bit less than that. My point is this is an organism that can grow in both a halophile, meaning a halophilic environment, one with extreme salt, and then it can grow in normal environments, not absent of all salt, but at least it has normal concentration of salt. And it depends on the organism, what it can do. That was a bit long answering that question. Uh, let's talk about some of the characteristics of eukarya. There are four kingdoms of the eukaryotes. All of these kingdoms lack peptidoglycan. So all of the eukaryotes lack peptidoglycan. You don't need to know about chitin in the cell wall of fungi. Let's talk a little bit about kingdom fungi. This involves the multicellular molds, which are also called unicellular because you can take one cell of a mold, grow it elsewhere, and it will reestablish the mold. It does include the mushrooms, and these are multicellular fungi. And it does include the unicellular yeast. 
most yeast are decomposers, but there are some yeast which are human pathogens. Candida albicans is an example of a, a uh, pathogenic yeast. Any questions about any of that? If not, I'm going to stop here and I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab. All right, bye.